the flowing mass, the fluid that's flowing through it, right? So those usually will cross off and also will typically neglect any heat transfer. It doesn't mean that the fluid coming in or out isn't hot in the usual sense. In other words, it has thermal energy, but that thermal energy is accounted for in the enthalpy. And so the purpose of either a turbine or a compressor is to go back and forth between work and enthalpy. Okay? So in other words, the energy that the stream carries, it's thermal energy and it's flow energy, which exist, of course, or are accounted for in the enthalpy term. So this is our general energy balance for both a compressor and a turbine. Of course, one has work in, the other one has work out. For a compressor, the compressors don't generate work, right? You put work into them, so we cross off the work out term. And we could then rearrange it to say that the work requirement for a compressor is equal to the energy change of the fluid as it moves. In other words, the, the, the fluid's energy changes, okay, the fluid power changes. That's the job of the compressor, is to convert work into fluid power. That's what this term represents. We increase the enthalpy, which means the temperature and the flow energy are increased by compressors. That's why when you use a compressor, the gas comes out hot. Because both the thermal energy and the flow energy are increased. But for a turbine, turbines, of course, don't require work in. They generate work out. And so if you rearrange that, you'd end up with a realization that all you're really doing is gaining work power at the expense of fluid power. Does that make sense? Yeah. Here, question. Sure. Uh, I don't know if this is actually possible, but if you ran like air through a nozzle and you had a fan at the back of the nozzle, would that be considered a turbine compressor or would that be considered like a nozzle? Like where the air is like it's like a nozzle coming in or the fan's like on the smaller end, so that's where the air is pushing through. What you're thinking is an intuitive argument. You're thinking that uh, you've blown on a pinwheel before. So what if we take a nozzle and increase the kinetic energy so we can really blow on a wheel? Yeah. You're kind of on the right track, but you have to be careful with that. The, the, the momentum of the, the fluid is important. When you design a turbine, for example, that's something that definitely has to be considered. Uh, because you want efficient transfer from the fluid power to the uh, mechanical power, right? In other words, you want the air to push on the blades in the most efficient manner possible. If, if the air is just flowing past the blade, that doesn't really do anything, right? Yeah. And so the velocity of the air and the velocity of the, the blade as it turns are important considerations. Okay, But more importantly, the purpose of a turbine is to convert thermal energy into work. That's really what we wanted. Flow energy to work is pretty easy, right? That's what you do with, with hydraulic fluid, for example. Okay, that's pretty simple. But when you're talking about a compressible fluid, now you have the opportunity of converting heat, what we would normally call heat, really the thermal energy of the fluid, into work. And that's really what we're trying to do, is make heat engines. Sometimes what you need to do is counterintuitive. For example, in a jet engine, what you do is you actually have a diffuser first, not a nozzle first, before you go into the compressor. And so that's a little bit counterintuitive, and a lot of things turn out that way. But it's because what you're really doing is working with thermal energy. And our intuition about kinetic energy doesn't necessarily help us all the time. Mr. Kuhn, you were going to say something. Answer my question. Okay. All right. So there are, are our energy balances for compressors and turbines. Now, obviously, if we have a compressor that has heat loss, which is very common, we can't get rid of Q dot out. That needs to be back in the equation. Okay. So our steady flow equation for a compressor would look a little bit different because it would include a heat loss term. All right, what about a throttling valve? Let's go back to uh, trying to figure out what we can cross off. A throttling valve is a valve that you set at some level, typically, in a steady state. It doesn't really change much. And all it does is reduce the pressure of the fluid across it. What terms do you think we could cross off here? Velocity, kinetic, like velocity. kinetic energy, velocity, yeah, probably. Do you think the kinetic energy would change? Well, there's a couple of different types of throttling valves we can consider. Have you, got, you guys have all taken the, the fluid power course with Professor Cooley, right? And so you've talked about um, a throttling valve, I guess, with hydraulic fluid, where you could drop pressure across it. What happens to the fluid as you drop the pressure across it? 
Okay, some of you have race cars. You've taken your race car to a dyno. And on the dyno, what happens? Well, all the work from your car's engine that makes it to the tires turns a hydraulic pump, right? And that hydraulic pump then has hydraulic oil that's now at high pressure because your car just put work into it, so now you got fluid power. And basically all you do is you take that, that hydraulic fluid and you put it across a valve so that it dumps the pressure. When that happens, what happens to the oil? Its temperature goes up because you can't destroy energy. So all of that flow energy goes into thermal energy when we're talking about a, a, a throttling valve in that case. In other words, the energy has to be conserved. Okay, so the temperature goes up. Now, does the density of the oil change much as it goes through the throttling valve? No, right? I mean, you compress hydraulic fluid, it shrinks a little bit, not hardly anything. That's why we can use hydraulic uh, excavators and things, right? If, if hydraulic fluid was more like a spring, you'd go to dig in the earth and you'd pull and pull and pull and when it finally released, it'd snap back, right? That'd be really bad. You don't want that. That's why we use hydraulic fluid, because it's very stiff. It's not as stiff as something like steel, but it's still pretty decently stiff. That's why, we, you know, if you use air, one of the problems in pneumatics is that if you use air and your cylinder's pulling, pulling, and can't pull, and all of a sudden the load releases, it snaps back because the air is very compressible. Okay? Anyway, so if we're talking about a hydraulic system, well, then it's pretty apparent that given the same flow area, the velocity is not going to change, but so the kinetic energy wouldn't change. What if we're using a refrigerant? Anybody know what happens when you take a refrigerant that is compressed, usually it's a compressed liquid, and it comes in on this side, it's at high pressure, and you drop the pressure, what happens? Some of it vaporizes, not all of it, but a decent amount of it vaporizes. And so, if it vaporizes, what happens to its density? It goes down. The specific volume goes up, its density goes down. If that happens, and given a similar flow area, the velocity has to increase, right? Because we're talking about steady state and the mass flow rate in equals the mass flow rate out. And so in that case, the, there might be some kinetic energy, but you're right, Mr. Henson, most of the time we will neglect that kinetic energy. The reason for that, what did you say happened when the, the, the uh, compressed liquid evaporated? The temperature dropped. That temperature drop is a much larger change, and it exists in this term, this enthalpy term. The temperature change is so large by comparison to the kinetic energy change that we can commonly neglect the kinetic energy change. So you're, I agree, we're going to drop off the kinetic energy term. We've done a lot of talking about this, but we haven't decided much about what terms need to go. What other terms need to go? Potential energy can go. Potential energy can go, I agree. We usually, potential energy is usually the first victim in this equation, right? Usually it goes away. Okay. There's, there's no work being done. No work being done, I agree, because there's no moving parts. Good. What else? Heat flow can go as well. I mean, there's no transfer. So. Oh. Right. Just because the temperature of the fluid drops or increases in the case of the hydraulic system doesn't mean there was any heat flow. One of the things students really struggle with is this idea that you can get a fluid to change temperature without adding or removing heat from it. It can still have the exact same amount of energy on this side as it had on this side, and yet it's temperature change without there being any heat flow. That's counterintuitive. The state change. The state change, the phase change also, which is really important. Okay. But yes, obviously the state change as well. So look at what we've eliminated already. The kinetic energy term, the potential energy term, the work terms, and the heat terms. The only thing we have left, in fact, the only thing we did not eliminate were the enthalpy terms. Right? So the enthalpy at the inlet and the exit of a throttling valve are the same, regardless of whether the fluid is compressible or not. And this is the equation that we'll use for throttling valves. And to understand what's really going on, we have to expand enthalpy. And remember, the enthalpy is not a thing. It doesn't exist. It's just a convenience thing that we use. It's just a convenience definition, I should say, that we use to uh, combine thermal energy and flow energy together. So don't worry about those notes. We've already talked through all that. How about a mixing chamber? What can I cross off here? Help me out. Potential energy. Potential energy, good. <laughs> Again, the first victim is down. What else? Velocity. Kinetic energy, in other words. Not necessarily velocity, oh, but okay. kinetic energy, right? Okay, so poten potential and kinetic energy are gone. What else? 
work in. Work in, how about work out? See some people saying yes, some people not sure. Give me an argument for yes. There's no output shaft. There's no output shaft. Absolutely. There's no nothing moving that has either force times distance capability or torque times rotation capability. So yeah, no work in, no work out. Heat. Just said I took a shower this morning. The temperature of the, from my hot water heater is probably 120. I would have been scalded. Or very uncomfortable. The temperature on the cold side was probably 55 <coughs> degrees. Mix the two together and I had a nice, I don't know, I'm going to guess 100 degree shower. I don't know. Is there any heat transfer? Let's mix each other. No heat transfer. Well, in the real world. You know, say, what if you were to mix like dough on an industrial level and it has a lot of resistance while you mix it? You're thinking of the chewing gum we watched last yeah. time. Okay, so you're mixing this dough. What form of energy are you putting into that? You're thinking of a mixing chamber, but you're, you're, that's not a mixing chamber at steady state because it's not like you have the ingredients coming in continuously and a flow coming out continuously. But let's just imagine bubble gum that way, right? Let's just imagine the process we saw as ingredients being poured in continuously on one side, maybe more of a screw type or something, right? The temperature would still go up. Why would the temperature go up? Because of what? No, because of kinetic. It's not flowing super fast because you're putting work into it. That's why. So the work, that, that force times distance, or torque times rotation, is what's going in in that case, and we couldn't cross off work in. The fluid coming out would have higher enthalpy because of the work we put into it. You guys are good and good at this. this is, I'm proud of you. But I think we've discussed all these terms and decided that the heat flow and workflow terms, as well as the kinetic and potential energies, would go away. And this begins to look a lot like the throttling valve from the last slide. The only difference is that now we have two entrances and one exit. So if we have two entrances and one exit, which is the, the common mixing chamber, then we can represent the uh, fluid power leaving as the sum of the two fluid power streams entering. Now from a mass balance, notice this is an energy balance, but from a mass balance, if we're at steady state, the mass flow rate out <coughs> equals the sum of the mass flow rates in. And so we can make a substitution for the mass flow rate leaving based on the incoming mass flow rates alone. And here's our energy balance for mixing chamber. And all real, really all that the mixing chamber does is mix all the energy together. That's not really a surprise, but that's what it does. That's what our energy balance says. What about a heat exchanger? Well, if we go through the same analysis with a heat exchanger, let's be careful here. Here's my system. Is there any heat transfer here? It's called a heat exchanger. So is there any heat transfer? I see some people saying yes. Some people aren't sure, and other people are saying no. Why would you say it's a, that there is heat transfer? In other words, you're saying we can't eliminate these terms. Why? There's two fluids passing unmixed. So I mean that like one fluid's going to have like one like one amount of heat, and the other fluid's going to have another amount. They're obviously going to exchange as they pass by. So there was some heat transfer between the two streams with the system that I've chosen. No, because you're not crossing the system boundaries. Exactly. Because I'm not crossing any system boundaries with the heat transfer, these two terms would go away. What? I thought it's called a heat exchange. It no, is. No, if the boundary was just in the gray area. That's right. If the boundary was right here, then we would have heat transfer in our equation. See, this is internal heat transfer. That's why there's no heat transfer across the boundary. So we can, and you can say, well, wait a second. That doesn't make any sense because how are you going to account for the fact that one stream heats up? Well, it increases energy, right? What form of energy does it increase? It's thermal energy. And that's already accounted for in the enthalpy. So we're not saying that this doesn't exist internally. We're just saying there's a different way to account for it. It's like saying, I could put money into my bank account by my, my company depositing it, right? Or I could put it in by I don't know, winning the lottery and I deposit it. Okay? There's many different ways of looking at things. That wasn't a very good analogy, but hopefully it helps a little bit. Yeah. That's better. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's that's better. So you, you could get money into your checking account by an external transfer from your company, or you could transfer from savings to checking, right? It's inside of the system. Thank you. That's a much better analogy. Yes. I know we've talked about this heat exchanger before, but sure. Like the work like you're putting work into the system, but just like the heat flow 
Are you putting work into the system? Yeah, I put work into the system, but you're changing the fluids. You're probably changing the fluids temperature. Sure. So, so what? Which one of these terms would account for that fluid change? It would be so there'd be no work either. Right. So you get rid of the work and the. I agree. You'd get rid of the work and the heat terms. Because there's no shaft or anything. Right. What other it, terms? It, it just seems like like counterintuitive to think there's no work being done in the system, but it's. But it's because of our definition of work. Our definitions of work and heat in this class are different from your usual language. It's a refinement of your usual language, okay, the common English language. And I know there's people in my family that don't like it when I start saying, well, that's not work. And yes, it is work. If I, if I take this box and I slide it across the counter, that's work. Well, in a sense, it is. The physics work is force times distance, right? My family, when they talk about this, they mean work that you get paid for. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. You know. and like I've told you guys before, as you become engineers, you'll begin to speak a different language, almost literally, uh, to the point that you'll be in conversation with another engineer and the people around you will say, what have you guys been talking about for the last 10 minutes? We haven't understood. That's just reality. It's okay. It's because your, your understanding of things is being refined. And that's the value that I'm trying to get into. So what have we eliminated? Heat, work, what other terms? I think we, somebody said potential, didn't you? Along the way. Yeah. How about kinetic energy? It's gone. It's gone too. All right. So we'll neglect all those and basically say that we've got the same equation that we had for the mixing chamber. Now in this case, instead of mixing mass, what we're really doing is mixing energy. So if we account for all of the energy carried in by fluid A and fluid B, well, wait a second. You look at this and you say, I thought fluid B carried the energy in because look, it's hot. Fluid A carries energy in also, right? Even though it's at a lower temperature, it is still carrying energy into the system. It is below, above a temperature of absolute zero. Therefore, fluid A is certainly carrying energy into the system. Okay? So we can't neglect that. How about the energy carried out? Well, stream A, which was the cold stream and it's warmed up, and stream B, which was the hot stream and it's cooled down, both of those carry energy out of the system as well. In fact, it's pretty obvious to look at stream B and say, yeah, it, it makes sense that even though B is at a lower temperature, it's still carrying energy out. This, there, in fact, it may be that this term is too big. It, it may be that we need a bigger heat exchanger so that stream B does not carry quite as much energy out. Look, there's still a difference in temperature. Maybe we can get a little more energy into stream A if we had a bigger heat exchanger. So if we rearrange the equation, we can write the mass flow rate of one stream in terms of the mass flow rate of the other stream and differences in the enthalpy between the hot fluid in and out and the cold stream in and out. Now here's the example where we would include a heat transfer and we would write an energy balance for the green system and the white system. The white system, for example, has this energy balance. And here we cannot eliminate heat transfer because there is heat flowing across the system boundary. And obviously what that heat does is change the enthalpy of fluid A. We can write a similar equation for the green system, which is around the pipe, and talk about the heat transfer out of the hot stream and how the, the fluid has to give up enthalpy to generate that heat. And then we can realize that the heat flow rate out of the hot fluid and into the cold fluid are equal to one another, and we end up right back where we were when we started with the whole system. So your intuition is not all the way off. You were just thinking of a different system if you thought there was heat transfer. But when the system does not, when the heat does not cross the system boundary, then it's not a term in the equation, and yet we end up in the exact same place because we've accounted for all of the energy forms that are important and how they move around. For pipe or duct flow, frequently all we can eliminate are kinetic and potential energies. And so there's a trade-off between any heat flows, work flows, and uh, enthalpy changes of fluids. So these are equations that are also useful for many different things. Um, and then finally we get to unsteady flow processes. Before we do this though, let's work some example problems. Probably end up taking our break as well. But this portion of chapter 5, the last I don't know, one, two, three slides or so, are unsteady flow processes. These are things you have not seen in 220 that are reserved for 320. So let's go, and if you're watching the video, uh, we'll switch over and we should be able to work, let's see, several of these. Uh, yeah, we can work all the way to problem 136. So we'll work the first 
3, 36, 51, and 68. Any questions before I shut off the video? All right.